So the topic of today's discussion is autologous transplant in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. As you are all aware, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is not one disease entity, it's not one disorder. It is a diverse group of diseases with varying pathogenesis, differences in treatment and significant differences in outcomes. So it would not be appropriate to treat all NHLs or to take all NHLs as a common thing because that will be like comparing apples to oranges. And therefore it is important that we separate out the different subgroups of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma because the role of transplant varies depending on the different subtype. What I will do in the next few minutes is to take you through the indications of transplant in the four major subgroups of NHL that is DLBCL, mantle cell lymphoma, follicular lymphoma and T cell NHLs. Subsequently, we will also see the salvage chemotherapies that are given pre-transplant and some of the post-transplant strategies aimed at reduction of relapses. Before we begin, it is important to know a basic concept or a basic principle that autologous transplant will benefit a chemosensitive disease. That means if the relapse is chemo resistant or if the disease is chemo resistant, it is unlikely to benefit from an auto transplant and such patients with chemo resistant relapses or chemo resistant malignancy may be candidates for allo transplant in very selected cases. Allo transplant is not something commonly practiced in NHL and it is indicated only in very select patients. But this general principle is important because all across the trials, those patients who have chemo resistant disease, they are taken off therapy or off protocol and they are not considered as candidates for auto transplant. Coming to the first subgroup, DLBCL, it is important to know that this is the largest subgroup of non Hodgkin's lymphoma. But some of the older studies, particularly those of the pre rituximab era, you may not find this term DLBCL. Having said that, a large chunk of patients would still be belonging to the, this category of NHL. So before the advent of rituximab, there were at least 10 or 11 randomized trials comparing transplant versus no transplant in patients with aggressive NHLs. As I've already told you, many of these pre rituximab trials have included several different disease entities, but the bulk of these would still remain DLBCLs. These trials had varying results from showing significant benefit to showing significant harm. And therefore it was essential to do a meta-analysis this meta-analysis published in 2003 has included 11 trials. All of them were randomized controlled trials of transplant versus no transplant. The full final meta-analysis included more than 2000 patients. And as you can see here, there was no difference in overall survival. Now this is as a consolidation therapy. That means in first complete remission. Even when we move to the rituximab era, there are randomized trials looking at auto transplant as a consolidation strategy. Now I'm not, I've not reached relapsed state, but you're given the patient CHOP or RCHOP and then you're consolidating with transplant. So in this randomized trial, after registration, patients were treated with CHOP or RCHOP. Those who received, those who attained partial or complete response, they were randomized to either continuation of three cycles of RCHOP, that is the non-transplant arm, or continuation of one more cycle of RCHOP followed by an autotransplant. And what we see here is there is no difference in the overall survival. Even with a follow-up of 10 years, 
the difference in survival does not there is not significant difference in overall survival likewise this is another similar trial of the in the rituximab era little different in terms of the trial design but primarily addressing the same question of transplant versus no transplant and if you look at the overall survival the curves are exactly on the top of one another so there is again no no benefit of transplanting a dlbcl in first complete remission whether it's in the pre rituximab era or in the rituximab era there is no benefit of transplanting a dlbcl in first cr and therefore when we counsel patients newly diagnosed dlbcl we don't tell them that they need to go for transplant however <coughs> what happens when we come to a relapsed disease so this is a old trial pre rituximab era 1995 of autologous transplant <coughs> compared with salvage chemotherapy alone in relapsed chemo sensitive non hodgkin's lymphoma so all patients with relapsed nhl they received bhap into two cycles that was the salvage regimen those who attained cr or pr were randomized to then continuation of four more cycles of bhap versus stem cell transplant and what we see is that overall response was strikingly different 84% in the transplant group versus 44% in the non transplant group and there was a significant improvement in the relapse free survival as well as the overall survival so if we look at the event free survival with conventional therapy that means with continuation of rchop alone the event free survival is as low as 10 to 12% in the long term but in the transplant group almost 40 to 45% of the patients were in the long term similarly similarly there were significant differences in the overall survival also favoring the transplant arm that was in the pre rituximab era in the rituximab era there have been trials this was a trial not looking at transplant versus not tra no transplant but this was a slightly different trial looking at the different salvage regimens and i'll come to this in detail later what is important to note from this trial is that even in the current era irrespective of whatever whatever salvage regimens were used in the study around 40 to 45% of patients or 40 to 50% of the patients are disease free in the long term so what it tells you is that if you have a dlbcl there is no role of transplanting up front those patients who relapse you can salvage them with a salvage chemotherapy followed by autologous stem cell transplant moving on to the next category mantle cell lymphoma mantle cell lymphoma is biologically very different from dlbl in fact even amongst the mantle cell lymphoma patients there is a spectrum of biology ranging from indolent diseases which can be kept on observation to aggressive blastoid mantle cell lymphomas so one of the early studies by the european mantle cell lymphoma network was again a prospective randomized trial looking at the role of autologous transplant what was done in this trial is that patients received four to six cycles of chop or chop like therapy those who had response pr or cr they then were randomized to either two more cycles of the same chemotherapy as consolidation therapy or to stem cell transplant and those who received only consolidation chemotherapy did receive maintenance therapy with interferon and then at relapse they could be salvaged with stem cell transplant what we see from this study is that there is a significant improvement 
in the progression free survival or the relapse free survival and as you can see here at 2 years as well as at 3 years patients in the transplant arm are doing much better as compared to patients who have just been continued on chemotherapy but another important thing to note from these curves is that for mantle cell lymphoma even with long term follow up the curves don't reach a plateau they they continue to fall so while the outcomes are better in the transplant arm as compared to the non transplant arm we still don't see a plateau in autologous transplant that was an older study this is a reasonably uh, this is one of the newer studies from the nordic lymphoma group and the mcl2 trial so what was done in this study is patients received chop alternating with high dose cytarabine for a total of 6 cycles this is a single arm study it's not a randomized trial stem cell harvest was done with cycle 6 that is the last cycle of cytarabine post stem cell harvest if there was a delay one or two additional chemotherapy cycles were allowed however subsequently within 6 weeks or so patients underwent transplant with beam or beak conditioning and they were intensively monitored for molecular mrd or molecular positivity by peripheral blood and those who had molecular positivity were then scheduled to receive rituximab for four doses so what we see here an excellent event free and overall survival to the tune of 65 to 70% with a very long follow now this study is has been compared with the mcl1 trial that was also from the same group but with which did not have cytarabine and which did not have rituximab the mcl1 trial still had transplant in it so this improvement in event free overall survival that we get here cannot be attributed to transplant it is possibly because of addition of cytarabine and rituximab so where do we stand in today's day and age as far as mantle cell lymphoma is concerned so this is a retrospective analysis large analysis more than 1000 patients of young patients treated with aggressive protocols in rituximab era over a period of 15 years so from the 1000 or 1000 lot patients around 2/3 of them underwent a transplant and 1/3 of them did not undergo a transplant primarily because of clinician's choice of not and not advising the transplant this is not a randomized trial the groups were not strictly comparable but if we look at the prognostic factors the patients who underwent transplant had significantly more poor prognostic factors like marrow involvement or a higher k67 and other factors even in spite of that what we see is that those who underwent transplant had a better progression free survival as well as overall survival and the pfs was better by about 30 months and a similar improvement in overall survival with a long follow up so what it tells us is that although in mantle cell lymphoma cytarabine and rituximab have no doubt added to an improvement in the survival of these patients still transplant holds a role and patients who have undergone transplant in spite of having more poor prognostic factors did better as compared to those who did not undergo transplant this is in first complete remission as a consolidative strategy what happens if we don't transplant and mantle cell lymphoma up front then post relapse the results are not good with long term survival being to the tune of about 25 to 30% and because of this reason currently auto transplant is considered as a standard of care in first cr for young patients with mantle cell lymphoma in mantle cell lymphoma you have to give your best in the first go after relapse there is nothing much which will really lead to a good or a decent long term outcome apart from the car t therapy which may change the scenario coming to the third subgroup of follicular lymphoma there are three randomized trials in the pre rituximab era for an upfront transplant 
none of them have shown an overall survival benefit and even in the rituximab era there is one trial which randomized trial which has failed to show a survival benefit in cr1 this is a large trial of archop versus high dose chemotherapy with stem cell transplant the trial design is a little different from what is usually seen the regimens are different in the two arms but in spite of giving sort of more aggressive therapy and transplant it did not translate to an improvement in overall survival as you can see the overall survival is similar irrespective of whether the patient underwent transplant or not in first complete remission so what happens again moving on to relapse here what happens in relapse state this is a little old study but the only randomized trial in follicular lymphoma randomizing patients from chemotherapy to transplant so a total of 140 patients were registered all patients received three cycles of chemotherapy chop or chop like regimens they were restaged those with cr or pr were randomized to one of the three arms the one arm was continuation of three more cycles of chemotherapy that is the that's what the c stands for the other is transplant using an unpurged stem cell support that's what the u stands for and the third one is high dose therapy with purged stem cells that what the p stands for so if we look at the results this is the event free survival and as you can see with just chemotherapy alone the event free survival is less than 20% and in both the transplant arms the event free survival is similar to the tune of about 55 to 60% there is also a significant improvement in overall survival which is around 30% at 7 years whereas it is about 60 to 70% in those patients who have undergone transplant so this study established that transplant is an important part of therapy in relapsed follicular lymphoma a more recent study in the rituximab era those patients who have undergone transplant patient number one transplant after first relapse this is not a randomized trial it is a trial it is a study looking at those patients who have undergone transplant versus dot not undergone transplant at their first relapse at the age of 70 years you can see there is a significant better event free survival as well as overall survival in those patients who undergo transplant one issue in transplanting patients with follicular lymphomas is that there is a high incidence of second malignancies to the tune of up to 12% reported in some of the studies now this could be because of the probably could be because of the older age of these patients and the longer follow up or the longer survival that these patients have in dlbcl patients may not live that much to have a second malignancy but in follicular lymphoma because it's a low grade lymphoma the median survival is better and therefore we see a significant incidence of second malignancies because of that we would consider transplant as a component of salvage therapy in otherwise fit and young patients if you have old patients with relapsed follicular lymphoma it may be better not to transplant them because of the high risks of transplant related mortality as well as subsequent problems i mean problems post transplant coming to the t cell non hodgkins lymphoma this is again a very heterogeneous group of lymphoma with different biology these are rare diseases with and we all know that the incidences of t cell and h cells are less than that of b cell counterparts and their outcomes are also poorer as compared to the corresponding b cell counterparts although not ideal to club them together they are often clubbed them clubbed together because of small numbers that are seen 
this is one of the early studies it's not a randomized trial it's an early study looking at the outcomes of anaplastic large cell lymphoma treated with transplant and what is important what was striking from this study is this those patients who were transplanted in cr1 had extremely good long term survival more than 90% now in a disease where we know that the outcomes are not good this is this was something which merited further exploration that whether we should be offering transplant in first year to patients with t cell nhls there are lots of retrospective and prospective studies more than 30 such studies i will point out to a couple of them this is one of the studies looking at high dose chemotherapy and autologous transplant now what is important to note from this study is that the overall survival of those patients who were transplanted in first cr was strikingly better as compared to those patients who were transplanted subsequently this could be a partial response this could be a second cr but chemosensitive state and then the but still the outcomes are much better if they are transplanted in first cr so just like mantle cell lymphoma consolidating t cell nhls seems to be a good option in first cr because subsequently the results don't seem to be as good similarly this is another study from the md anderson center of 126 patients similar findings those who were transplanted in first cr their four year survival was 87% as compared to those who were transplanted in subsequent cr or in pr where the results were around 40% so there is a wide gap or a wide difference in the outcomes when the patients are transplanted up front as a part of consolidation cell therapy these were retrospective studies this is a prospective trial or a prospective study from the nordic lymphoma group one of the largest prospective studies till date it included 160 patients and like the previous studies a mixed bag of t cell lymphomas were included although the study protocol did allow for alk positive alcls none of the patients who actually underwent transplant in cr1 were alk positive alcls and the reason is that alk positive alcls anyway have a good prognosis and doing transplant or adding transplant to their therapy is unlikely to make their prognosis better except in the subgroup with poor biology so the findings of this study were similar to the, those from the previous retrospective studies with an overall survival to the tune of about 50% in the long term now when we look at the major subgroups of t cell nhl those with alk negative alcl did the best although the difference was not statistically significant possibly because of the small numbers in each group but if you look at the curves alk negative alcl probably does better as compared to the other histologies these are some of the other prospective studies and as you can see here around 65 to 75% of the patients included in these analysis have undergone transplant in cr1 and the five year survival has been reasonably around 50 to 60% moving to the next part of salvage chemotherapies that are given pre transplant here we are spoiled by choice we have a large list which can be used gemcitabine dexamethasone and cisplatin or carboplatin dhap is mine ishap and many more now globally or what has been historically dhap by default seems to be the most commonly used regimen across most studies and you must have noted that in all the previous studies that the salvage regimen majority of the centers do prefer dhap but is there a scientific reason to choose that yes so this is a, this is a randomized trial looking at two different salvage regimens in patients with relapsed dlbcl one arm received dhap with rituximab as a salvage regimen the other arm received 
I is with rituximab as a salvage regimen. In both the groups, after three cycles of chemotherapy, stem cell harvest was done, and those patients who had CR or PR underwent transplant, followed by a second randomization to rituximab maintenance versus observation. So the purpose of this trial was to address two questions. One is, is one salvage regimen better than the other salvage regimen? And second is, does post-transplant rituximab add a benefit to transplant? What, what was found from this study as far as the salvage regimen is concerned? You have seen this graph previously. There was no difference in the overall or the progression free survival depending on which arm the patient was, whether the patient received DHAP or whether the patient received ICE, there was no difference in their long term survival. There is a similar, or rather, there is a biological study arising from this study called the Biocoral study, which points to a possible difference between the two groups when the patients were classified by the GCB or the non-GCB subtypes. However, that's not the primary focus of this study. The primary focus was to compare RDHAP versus RIs and it found no difference in the progression free or the overall survival. This is another randomized trial comparing GDP, which is our institutional, I mean, it's our standard of care at our center versus DHAP before autologous stem cell transplant. And what you can see here is that the progression free survival and the event free survival are exactly similar. There is no difference whether you use DHAP or you use GDP. And that's why I said that we are spoiled by choice. There are too many regimens. There are another two randomized trials, one from uh, Egypt, and another one. So these three trials, the one which I showed previously, as well as these two, they have all randomized DHAP to GDP for relapsed refractory DLBC. All the three trials show that there are similar outcomes in terms of responses, in terms of progression free and overall survival, no difference for all the three trials for both the regimens. But there have been significantly lesser toxicities with GDP, lesser incidence of febrile neutropenia with GDP, lesser hospitalizations, and a better quality of life compared to patients who have received DHAP. So as far as choosing the regimens goes, GDP may not be better in terms of responses or progression to your overall survival. But it is better in the sense that there are lesser toxicities, lesser hospitalization, and better quality of life of patients receiving GDP. That also brings me to this concept of mobilization adjusted response rate, which is an important parameter to compare the salvage regimens. Mobilization adjusted response rates refers to Patients who have attained a CR or a PR with salvage chemotherapy and are adequately able to collect stem cells. We have already seen that without transplant, just with continuation of chemotherapy, the survival is not going to be great. And therefore, we do need to transplant them. But suppose your salvage chemotherapy damages the stem cells to an extent that you can't harvest the stem cells, then there may not be a meaning in giving such a salvage regimen and say for example regimen a gives a response rate of 90 percent but of those 90 patients only 20 are able to collect the stem cells then the mobilization adjusted response rate is 20. as against that say another regimen gives you a response of about 50 percent but there are no failure of mobilization then the mobilization adjusted response rate is 50. And this concept is important because in the olden days when Minibeam was used as a, as a salvage regimen, there were lots of mobilization failures. What we see for the commonly used regimens for GDP, the mobilization adjusted response rate is around 60%.
and for D hat and ice, it is about 50 to 55 percent. And this is from the randomized study which I just alluded to. Coming to the last part, the post transplant strategies, the single most important cause of transplant failure in autologous transplant for lymphoma is disease relapse and disease relapse can happen at varying period. There are early relapses, there are late relapses and therefore again several strategies have been tried to improve the outcome whether it's with rituximab or bortezomib with mantle cell lymphoma or exazomib, bubinutinib, nihalidomide, bubinutuzumab in older days interferon. Unfortunately not even one of them has been shown to be associated with better survival with the single exception of rituximab in mantle cell lymphoma. So for the rest of the drugs, they would still be considered under the purview of a clinical trial. And the only one which is there in routine practice is rituximab for mantle cell lymphoma. This is the same study that we saw a couple of slides earlier where the randomization was between RDHAP and RIs. Here, the second randomization was between rituximab maintenance versus observation. And what was found was that there is no difference in maintenance rituximab versus observation. In fact, there was a significantly increased incidence of infections in the maintenance arm. Therefore, in DLBCL, there is no role of giving maintenance rituximab. But what happens in mantle cell lymphoma? This is a randomized trial of uh, maintenance rituximab after transplant. Patients were given rituximab every two monthly for a total duration of three years. And what we see is that there is a significant improvement in the progression free survival as well as the overall survival with addition of maintenance rituximab. As I told you, in, in mantle cell lymphoma, first chance is your best chance. If there is a relapse, then subsequently, there is not much that is associated with good survival. You will get some long-term survivors, but not a very decent long-term survival. So unlike in DLBCL, Maintenance rituximab is associated with improvement in overall survival as well as relapsed survival in patients with mantle cell lymphoma. To conclude, autologous transplant is the standard of care for relapsed chemosensitive DLBCL. We do not offer transplant in first complete remission. Upfront as a consolidation therapy for mantle cell lymphoma. Upfront as a consolidation therapy for most patients with T cell NHLs, with a notable exception of all positive ALCLs, where the, where the results are already good, and for selected patients with relapsed follicular lymphoma. I have used the word selected because many patients with follicular lymphoma are old, may not be candidates for transplant. And even amongst the younger patients, especially those who have limited stage disease, you could probably think of treating them with radiation and then reserving transplant for a later use. There are several salvage regimens pre-transplant, not much to choose, either of them is fine, but GDP seems to be more tolerable and more manageable and probably associated with lesser failure of mobilization and post-transplant strategies are under clinical trial with the exception of rituximab in mantle cell lymphoma, which is the standard clinical practice. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions. Yeah, I think there are no questions in the chat, chat box. So, um, may I ask two questions, uh, sir? So, uh, first is, um, how do you counsel uh, uh, a patient of relapsed uh, large B-cell lymphoma, like DLBCL, uh, depending on uh, 
the the previous DFS or pet response after salvage. Uh, what is the outcome that you quote to the patient? That is one. And second is uh, choosing the salvage. So we have options of GDP, uh, DHAP, mine. So there are some uh, data from um, BioCoral data that uh, the DHAP is better in GCB and uh, than than in a non DHAP kind of regimen. So, uh, do you think that is that has any merit in choosing the type of salvage? So, okay. so uh, there are a lot of prognostic factors at relapse as well as post uh, salvage chemotherapy, which will help us to determine the outcomes post transplant. Two of the most important factors are the disease-free interval. And that has been consistently shown across most studies that if the disease-free interval is short, then the outcomes tend to be worse even with transplant. Most studies have taken a cutoff of less than one year versus more than one year. However, it's not a, a watertight boundary, and it's a spectrum. So the earlier the relapses are after, after uh, the initial upfront therapy, the worse is the outcome, that is one. The second thing is pet response. So that is another very important factor that will determine the outcome for transplant because that's a marker or an in vivo marker of chemosensitivity. Those patients who have chemosensitive disease, they, we have already seen that they will do better as compared to those who have a chemo resistant disease. In fact, for chemo resistant disease, we would not consider them for transplant. Now, even amongst those with chemosensitive disease, there is a difference between those who attain a CR and those who attain a PR. And that again has been shown by many studies, including our own data that those who are transplanted in CR tend to do better as compared to those who, and those who are transplanted in partial response. There is a very limited data that for those who have partial response, maybe giving them radiation as a part of conditioning therapy can help to overcome that. However, that data is not very, not very robust and most centers would not practice adding radiation to conditioning because it increases the toxicity of conditioning regimen. Coming to the second question of uh, choosing the regimen, yes, the biocoral study did show that in the subgroup, in this subgroup of patients, in some subgroup of patients, the DHAP was better than the uh, ICE. And in fact, the difference in the response rates were as much as 100% versus 53%. But that is, that certainly is something which is hypothesis generating. It, I wouldn't take it as a I mean, as a hard evidence to suggest that yes, in this group, we should do that. If we look at the full text of the biocoral study, there is no uh, there is no hypothesis that has been explained for that apart from the fact that there is some differences in the metabolism of uh, Arasi. But I think that requires further studies in order to tell us whether actually DHAP is better than uh, ICE in the subgroup of patients with GCB DLBC relapsed. So in an upfront PTCL, what is the substitute like to do transplant, newly diagnosed CR1? So most studies have included all sorts of PTCLs in CR1 with the signal notable exception being ALK positive ALCL that most studies have excluded or many studies have excluded. But apart from that, there are, it all depends on the biological behavior. If it's an indolent behaving disease, then maybe we could consider not to transplant them. Otherwise, as a general practice, in especially in PTCL NOS, where which is the largest uh, subgroup of PTCL, we would consider to transplant them in first CN. Because if they relapse, then then subsequently, if we give them salvage and transplant, then the results are not what we would get in DLBCLs. The results are much poorer. So therefore, if we have to transplant, the ideal time would be first CR. Having said that, if someone has a relapse disease, then still the most optimal treatment does remain salvage therapy followed by transplant. 
but the ideal timing to choose that would be the first year yeah because the, the response rate to salvage is in t t cell yeah, response rate is not like b cell lymphomas where you can get good responses and then salvage them with autologous transplant t cell and the responses are not that good it's more not more than 30% maybe one to the so amit has two questions like uh, the role of transplant in elderly mantle cell lymphoma and uh, the role of transplant in burkitt okay so as i told you elderly mantle cell lymphoma i mean elderly is something which is perceived differently if you look at the western people even 65 and 70 years of them are fit enough and they go and play golf and football so it all depends on the fitness of the patient if the patient is fit enough to tolerate intensive therapy or aggressive therapy then yes they should be considered as candidates for transplant but those who are otherwise fail frail or have significant comorbidities in them it may be prudent not to uh, consider them for transplant or if we even have to if we if we in fact turn up to be consider counseling them or concern, considering them for transplant then to reduce the doses of conditioning chemotherapy the second question is burkitts burkitts there is no much data to suggest that transplantation benefits burkitts and therefore at, at as of current day and age transplant is not considered as a part of therapy for burkitts lymphoma it hasn't been shown to be associated with improved survival although there are some small studies looking at that in fact the older studies in the pre-rituximab era did include some patients with burkitts lymphoma but really no not much benefit of transplant and would not consider transplant for burkitts lymphoma thank you so i think the, we have end the the questions there are no more questions ha uh, yes sir yes sir go ahead sir. so sachin you covered nicely uh, about the transplant so there's a two point i want to uh, kind of uh, you to talk on is one is uh, role of uh, transplant in a maybe very minor or subset of glb cell afferent so double hit uh, lymphomas this one thing and uh, printexumab salvage in the t cell uh, setting when it is often not used in the upfront setting in our uh, cases right so in uh, the first one in double it lymphomas there are two or three single arm studies or sort of retrospective comparisons between those patients who have undergone transplant in cr1 versus those who have not undergone transplant and they really didn't show an improvement in the outcomes with transplant so what both of those studies conclude is that the double hit lymphomas are actually a poorer biology transplant doesn't benefit them significantly and we do need to look for newer therapies which probably can improve their survival uh regarding the use of brentuximab yes brentuximab is an important sort of upcoming salvage therapies in t cell lymphoma but as of date it is not accessible to the vast majority of our patients and even if there are responses with brentuximab they are not very long lasting they are not very long lived so eventually i mean it's it's best suited as a bridge to transplant where we will eventually have to take the patient up for transplant yeah i agree i think both the situations the data is not really great and no the the us uh, retrospective data of multi center double it lymphoma so patient who didn't receive intensive induction uh, therapy for double it they benefited with the transplant in cr1 but i completely agree data is not uh, really great yeah yeah and uh, similarly for bv in the t cell salvage i think uh, data is really not great but this is one of the option which should be probably explored yes, in the yes. therapy positive yes yeah, yeah thank you so much Yeah, I think we still have time. If anybody has any questions, they can unmute and ask. Um, any residents? Can I ask one question? Uh, yes, uh, yes, sir. Sir. So, uh, uh, Sachin, uh, is it fair to uh, uh, listening to the whole topic to suggest that uh, DLBCL where one should be uh, there is a, a very good evidence and we should have those patients for transplant and other places one needs to be very careful other places in the, in the other histologies yes other histologies like so, mantle uh, follicular uh, 
uh, and all, all what you showed uh, so even with the even with other histologies uh, uh, excluding hodgkins yeah yeah excluding hodgkins and even with other histologies transplant has its place in in several scenarios especially in mantle cell mantle cell lymphoma where it's a part of the upfront consolidation therapy i mean dnbcl it's not a part of the upfront consolidation therapy because at relapse we know that we can salvage them with chemotherapy and transplant if they relapse and give them a decent 40 50% long term survival that's not the case with mantle cell lymphoma where post relapse the outcomes are not about more than 20 25 or 30% So, so how to select those mantle cell for transplant so, all, all of them should be uh, so all, uh, all young all young and fit patients should be considered as candidates for transplant there is an international prognostic index for mantle especially for mantle cell lymphoma called the mipi index mipi which will help you to categorize patients with low intermediate and high risk disease those with low risk disease probably do better even with without considering them for transplant but those with intermediate and high risk disease should certainly be considered as candidates for transplant and this likewise there is also a ipi for dlbcls many of the older studies have restricted transplant in cr1 to those with ipi 4 and 5 but even in that high subgroup there is really not level 1 evidence to say that transplant has benefit in in some of the studies of dlbc in subgroups with ipi 5 there is four or five there is some benefit of transplant but it would not be considered as a reasonable evidence to suggest transplant in first year to dlbc no i was not talking about a first uh, uh, you know uh, first line treatment i was like talking about in general so yes certainly uh, and certainly yes a part of therapy for dlbc thank you thank you yes sir amitya sir regarding that sir elderly mantle cell i have a patient of 72 years who is tolerating our chop alternating with our rrc high dose so we think he is tolerating it good so even at 72 years if he is tolerating well and, and the goals are clear that we can consider for auto transplant for this patient i mean uh... it's the physician's call whether the patient is fit or not but i would like to caution that tolerating r chop and cr is different from tolerating a beam or a lace because you know, the doses are much higher and uh, particularly at an elder age many of them do have subclinical damages to their target organs or to their gut and other organs which which makes the them difficult to tolerate a transplant they will go through chop smoothly but uh may not go through transplant smoothly at an age of 72 so any concept of a such in uh, physiologically being young in a transplant setting well yes physiologically i mean the age is one of the single most important prognostic factors for all sorts of toxicities and outcomes in transplant uh those who are physiologically young are young for example in if we look at many western, western data not just for auto transplant even for allo transplant they do consider transplanting patients up to 70 years of age and in fact in uh, the annual ash meeting in 2020 there was a presentation of more than 70 years old myeloma being transplanted with 2200 patients but that is uh, in their setup they are, they they are fit enough as i told you where they can go and play golf and football but if you look at our patients at an age of 65 or 70 years the majority of them would be frail would not be able to or would be barely able to carry on their day to day activities so there certainly is a concept that age matters and it's not the numerical age it's more to do with the physiological age thank you